Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And we are your hosts of this podcast, which explores the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning incidents throughout the centuries and creates curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. How are you, Nick? I'm very well. Very well indeed. How's your week been? It's been pretty good. Can't complain. No poisonings? No poisonings. Yet again, it's very dull so far. I know. I have just had my eyebrows done, so if I look permanently surprised... (laughs) It's because of the wonderful tale we're going to spin today. Absolutely. Thank you to all of our new followers and our new listeners who have joined us on this crazy journey. We so appreciate all the reviews that people have been leaving and the wonderful comments and lovely chats that we've been having with people. It's fantastic. Thanks so much for getting in touch. It's great to hear what you think and get your ideas. So, Nick, ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Yes. Or drink poison and talk about cocktails? No. See, I'm fairly certain one of these days you're going to flip that on me and I'm going to get really confused. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll only have yourself to blame. <laughs> I will. If you, are a... <laughs> poisoned by, if you are poisoned to death, then you'll know why. I'll know why. So, this week, Nick, I gave you a secret ingredient. You did. A little bit of a curveball, wasn't it? Uh, it wasn't what I was expecting, I must admit. Because the secret ingredient this week is chicken. Chicken not usually found in cocktails. Not usually um, found in cocktails. But when you think about it, that is actually gives you a very good ingredient for cocktails. One that's used in many cocktails. Does it? Because I really thought I'd screwed you on this no, one. No, no, no. <laughs> You'll have to try harder than this. Ooh, I trust your abilities, Nick. So, okay, what have you done with chicken? Well, we've gone with egg whites. Oh! Chicken, egg, which came first? Uh, I'm going with the egg whites and the cocktails. And the cocktails. The cocktails before they're even chicken. Absolutely. So we have egg whites from the chicken. Nice link. So egg whites like used it. in a lot of cocktails. Interesting. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of egg white in cocktails. So why is egg white used in cocktails? It just gives you a very nice mouth feel, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> it's very silky, creamy. Yeah, just sort of texture. And Interesting. Very nice. And you get the excellent sort of foamy head on top of a cocktail. Indeed. Um, and it just looks very smart. Okay, because last week, obviously, we had we had um, lumpy issues. We had lumpy issues that were resolved with more experimentation. And it was definitely the lacto-free nonsense. Never do that. Never use lacto-free. Even if you're lactose intolerant. I don't care. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> just suffer. Suffer just for suffer, your art. Suffer, suffer through it for the sake of a very nice cocktail. I'm not one for an egg whitey cocktail. I haven't tried many of them, but I am really intrigued to see yes. what we've got. So... It's, it's not my usual thing that I make just because it's a bit of a faff um, and I don't often have eggs in the house really so why don't you have eggs in the why house why don't you eat a lot of eggs ah didn't so, know that so about I you Nick to, I had to go out and buy eggs finding out new things about oh, you no. every week aren't you lucky that's not interesting to anyone <laughs> it's else not really, no. <laughs> 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 moving on moving on so this week I have made a white lady a white lady quite a classic that you're looking at me like you've never heard of it. I haven't heard of okay. it, but I like the sound of it because it sounds mysterious. It sounds, it sounds like mysterious. a haunting and absolutely just like I can picture a woman on the edge of a of a forest by a castle, just beckoning you in to to, to get drunk so with her. Exactly what this cocktail does. Sweet, it beckons you. <laughs> I'm excited. So to now try I'm going to make it now. Egg white cocktails, best made fresh. So I haven't made this one yet, and have it sitting around on the side. Fresher is better. Oh, excellent! Um, so, so for the first time, we're gonna we're gonna pause. We're gonna have a cocktail making pause. Yeah, while, while I... Nick shakes up a storm. We'll be back in two shakes of a <laughs> cocktail thing. <laughs> What's it called? Shaker. A cocktail, two shakes. Right. Two shakes of a cocktail shaker sounds weird. No, it sounds good. I like that. No, it isn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> two shakes of a two shakes of a cocktail shaker. Two shakes of a cock. Who and... knows? <laughs> I don't want this cocktail now if that's what you're going to do, Nick. Well, I'm going to go make some cocktails, so I'll be right back in a second. And we're back from our cocktail break. Oh, the shaking. And we have our white ladies. Very pretty, very elegant looking. They are I very like smart. it. Yes, it's kind of got a, a nice hue to it. Yes, indeed. I imagine if that had a different liqueur or something in it, which was coloured, colour in the bottom with a white foam on the top. Yeah, it does. It, quite striking. Yes, it's a really pretty drink. So mm. what is in this delicious cocktail? In this one, we have uh, we have gin. We have triple sec, which mm. is an orange liqueur. Uh, we have lemon juice mm. and a drop of sugar mm. and egg white. <gasps> mm. So we, we're looking for sort of a kind of a sharpy... Particularly yeah, orangey, but smooth and lovely. Well, cheers! Thank you again, cheers. Nick, for making it. Let's, see Let's it's try. Wrong. I really like that's that. That's quite smart. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, finally, we've got one that immediately I'm on board <laughs> yep, with. That's 
Oh, that's delicious. That's going into the repertoire of cocktails I make quite often. Definitely. That is, that's very much my kind of cocktail. It's sharp, tangy, and it's not overly boozy as well. It's dangerous, actually, in fact, because you'd be like, it's quite a refreshing drink. Oh, yeah. You can imagine that on a, oh, on a piazza in Italy or sort of (laughs) over, or in our case, just passed out in your garden outside in the sun. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. But But you, you can tell why it's a classic. It's a good cocktail. And the egg white wouldn't know. Wouldn't know there's egg white in there, obviously. No, it just adds a nice a smooth, smoothness, smoothness to it all. To and that it. foam on the top, which you wouldn't get without. Exactly. Without Looks that. lovely, tastes lovely. That is a resounding success. Yeah. I'm all about Hurrah. the white ladies. Excellent. All the white ladies. All the white ladies. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> so I'm quite intrigued about what poison or case involves chickens. Chicken. <laughs> Chicken. Please don't hit me when you find out what it <laughs> is. This is going to be the most obscure connection possible. There is a connection to chicken. Right. You were just trying to screw me over with cocktail no, ingredients. No, 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 no. I was thinking, and obviously we've got a lot of poisonous and a lot of cases to work through. I don't just want to go for the obvious things. There are some more obvious liqueurs and drinks in this story. But you know what? I trusted you, Nick, and you <laughs> delivered. You delivered. You didn't let the people down. Excellent. Glad so, to hear it. So this week, Nick... Yes. We are discussing, it's a big one. Is it? We're discussing the case of William Palmer. So you say that like I should know who William Palmer is. He's the Prince of Poisoners. I should know who he is then. Failed miserably in my poisoner knowledge. William Palmer, one of the most notorious cases of poisoning in the 19th century, one of the most notorious murder cases of the 19th century, that it prompted Charles Dickens himself to dub him the greatest villain who ever stood and the Old Bailey. So this this time I am envisioning the classic Victorian baddie with a with a top hat and a twirly moustache. <laughs> twirly moustache. Possibly just tied a damsel to some railway tracks as well. He did that and then poisoned her. <laughs> and then poisoned them. Okay. We'll dial it back a bit. Okay. Let's, let, let, let's, let's start from the beginning. But yes, very, very famous person. It has been referenced in Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Speckled Band. This the real case. The snake on the, yes. uh, on the ring, on the bell pull. Don't, that don't give that away. You've ruined that You've now ruined for Sherlock people. Holmes. You've ruined Sherlock Holmes for everyone listening to it. It's over. That's it. Well, screw him. We're the new Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> that, that's a bold claim to make. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The cocktail has emboldened me. Palmer, actually, his waxwork model stood in the Chamber of Horrors in Madame Two Swords for 122 years. That's quite a reputation to have. Removed in 1979, I believe it was. There's even been a film made about him, The Life and Crimes of William Palmer. They even say that the phrase, what's your poison? is a reference to this man. I know, I definitely want to hear more. But why William Palmer, we wonder? Because actually, William Palmer was only convicted of killing one man, his friend John Cook. Just one man. Is this like he was convicted of killing one man, but suspected of killing 5,000 or something? Well, come with me on a journey, Nick. <laughs> so I'm, let's... I'm going with the white lady. Go with the white lady. Go with the white lady and <laughs> in hand into the forest of poisoners. <laughs> I'll start at the end. It's the 14th of June, 1856, outside Stafford Prison. Around 30,000 people have gathered. The condemned is pressed to confess his guilt. Cook, he says, did not die from strychnine. This is no time for quibbling. Did you or did you not kill Cook? The Lord Chief Justice summed up for poisoning by strychnine. So William Palmer was born in Staffordshire in 1824. He's one of seven children... Big family, but Mm. much doted on by his mother. So she really does spoil him. His father died when he was 12, and leaving the family a very sizable inheritance, he himself stood to inherit £7,000 when he came of age at the age of 21. But because of his mother's attention on him, he was quite a selfish child. In his first job as a teenager in a chemist, he was accused of opening the post and stealing money. And he would have been arrested, he would have been tried if his mother hadn't stepped in and smoothed Uh. things over. So mummy is looking after William from an early age. He continues to push the boundaries of the law. He is caught embezzling, he's caught stealing. One of his colleagues um, is seen stepping out with a girl that he quite likes and allegedly he pours acid all over his belongings. That's somewhat dramatic. Mm. William goes on to study medicine in London. He qualifies in 1846 as a physician. Seems to have scraped through by the skin of his teeth because as soon as he goes to London to study medicine, he starts to indulge in all of the vices. He loves to drink, he loves to gamble, and he loves the ladies. This does have an echo echo of our first episode. We have a doctor who was enjoyed the, the, the niceties of life. Well, I suppose in the first episode, Dr. Lamson was uh, addicted to morphine. Yes. So he had a drug habit, you know, and he had seen the horrors of the war. 
Whereas you've got William Palmer here, who's a sport little boy, who's never really had to suffer, who's never had to do any hardship, and Mummy is helping him through his life. So even in his, um, as he studies for his medical uh, qualification, allegedly his mother has to pay for an extra tutor, she d- pulls all sorts of strings just to get him this qualification while he's out living the high life. But he comes back to Staffordshire, and he sets up a practice in Rugley as a doctor. He marries Annie Thornton. She's a very pretty girl, by all accounts, but she's also an illegitimate child. Her mother had an affair with a colonel, but the colonel looks after Annie. He gives the mother money. He gives money. She's going to come into inheritance as well. So Annie is delighted. She never thought that she was going to be married. She thought that her illegitimate status, which was known, would put people off. Not William. Oh, no, not William. William sees past that to the vast amounts of money that she has. (laughs) And true love rings true. (laughs) Absolutely. They marry and they go on to have five children. Annie's mother as I said, was also sitting on a sizable inheritance and she did not like William. She did not take a liking to him at all. She thought that he was after Annie's money. I mean, the very thought of it. How how could she think such a thing? She also accused him of poisoning her cats. Oh, God. That's unacceptable. That is the greatest (laughs) crime in all of this. If he did anything to those cats. But... As often happens, as often happens, so that's just weird. Well, cats. people, no, he doesn't poison their cats. I was going to say, as often happens, someone died. But Annie's mother does die, and Annie and William do come into an inheritance a lot smaller than yeah. he thought it was. Annie's not bothered. William is furious. <laughs> yes. Because William, as we've said, has developed a penchant for gambling, and he starts to borrow money to feed his habit. This is never going Shall to end we well. Well, he thinks he might have a future in horse racing. There are a lot of people at that time, respectable people, who did gamble, gambled professionally. And he thinks he's got a way with money. He thinks he can make a living with this. He really doesn't. He really doesn't. No. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> at the same time, though, he's he's really taking an interest in his wife's well-being. You know? I'm sure he is. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to her. And so he makes sure that he insures her life for £13,000. He's, he's a generous man. Caring, loving husband. Indeed. He just wants to make sure that the family and he is set up. Whether he takes out life insurance on himself, not so much. <laughs> but, you know, he makes one payment and he is suddenly struck with a sudden illness. Suddenly. Yes. What a surprise. Had a cold, but William tended to her, prepared her meals, <laughs> stroked her head, made sure that she wanted for nothing in terms of medicine and food. Yeah. But Annie keeps vomiting repeatedly. And after two weeks, poor Annie is dead, age 27. William's heartbroken. Yeah, I'm sure. He's really heartbroken. <laughs> it's only a coincidence that exactly nine months later, his housemaid gives birth to his <laughs> illegitimate son. Oh, uh, yes. Entire, entire coincidence. That's the trauma. It was a very difficult time I'm for him. I'm sure it was. I'm sure the, the housemaid was very comforting in his time of need and distress. Indeed. But, William, you know, he has a plan. I mean, he's only a little bit in debt. Somewhere in the region of £23,000. <laughs> uh, and the creditors are really getting impatient with William. I can imagine they would be. What's worse, not only are they knocking on his door, they're threatening to go to mummy he is terrified that must be embarrassing but mummy thinks william can do no wrong mm. because she's never heard of anything like this it's quite interesting that some debts have uh, been signed by his mother they bear the <laughs> signature oh dear but william is thinking of um how else he can look after his family um he also thinks about his brother walter <laughs> oh walter is a drunk you know william's trying to look after him sending him gin and brandy all the time He's and... a ge- again a generous caring he, exactly he wants to get a life insurance policy for walter as well he thinks that eighty four thousand pounds <laughs> is a respectable amount and However, he gets it it's not so easy yeah. this time walking around various insurance companies saying this drunken man is worth eighty four thousand pounds please does not work out very well for no. him um he is turned down repeatedly unsurprising but he manages to get one policy for fourteen thousand pounds ah. oh thank god so william has his insurance on walter and it's not long before walter <laughs> the drunk that he is unfortunately dies Probably related to alcohol. I mean, probably. And so, William, <laughs> one is off to the insurance company. Money, please. Yes, I want to check £14,000. Insurance company refused to pay up. Good. They're a little suspicious about why William had insisted that Walter's coffin be sealed before his <laughs> wife had a chance to look at him. Sorry, Walter is married. Oh, yeah. And William has taken a life insurance policy in his favour yes. over his wife. Yes. Now that's a skillful negotiating. Well, the insurance company questioned this after it's happened. They're going, hmm, don't we think the wife maybe should have benefited from this? Yeah, we maybe should have thought of this before we really signed all those done. papers. But they have thought of it and they refuse to pay out. You know, a little too late for Walter. Yeah. 
They start investigating, though. They start looking around at William. They find out that William had also been attempting to take out a £10,000 insurance policy on the life of George Bate, a farmer who was previously in his employment. But the company still refused to pay out to William. So William has nothing. He's shaken at this stage. Whatever his debts are, there's no life insurance policies to pay out anymore. Enter John Cook. Who's John Cook? John Cook is a good friend of William's. And he actually does very well for himself as well. Whereas William's um, success rate at the horse racing tracks, is the horse racing tracks called... Was horse racing called tracks or is that dog tracks? No, um, maybe he was at the dog course, tracks course, as well. Uh, racing, uh, I don't know actually. Well, his success at the racing course, course, yes. I was going to say steeple. <laughs> that's that's a type of race, isn't it? Where that's they a, go it's the steeple and chasing. They go through fields and things, and then you just bet and hope that they have come back alive. <laughs> you see, we are pro- professional gamblers. We are professional gamblers here. <laughs> But they are very good friends and they often go to the meets at Shrewsbury. And around November, William is particularly desperate. He goes to the races uh, with John Cook and several other friends. He really needs to win. Cook himself is a little bit down on his luck at this point, but he puts all his money on one horse, Polestar. Good name. Polestar wins him £3,000. Nice. Yay, John Cook! Palmer. How much does he lose? Bets all of his money (laughs) on one horse. Not Polestar, is it? No. No. It loses. Do you know what the horse was called? No. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like chicken it. Chicken the horse. Why would you call a horse chicken? <laughs> it, it, allegedly, he owned two horses and he called them Nettle and Chicken. Why? <laughs> it's not a lucky name. It's really not. Even if he doesn't own the horse, why would you bet on one why called would you Chicken? Bet on a horse called Chicken. I just have the vision of the Simpsons episode of Krusty just standing there going, <laughs> "I've got my last ten bucks, and you don't look at me. Run!" <laughs> it's just several chickens taped together <laughs> and being hurled along the race course. <laughs> why would you bet on a horse called Chicken? That's a stupid pole star inspiration. Pole star, dramatic. Pole star, pole star. Absolutely. Chicken. Um, but <laughs> if, chicken. No. If Palmer did name it, it was just, he was obviously that desperate. Just a horse. Chicken. I don't care what it's called. Make it win. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> yep. So chicken. Chicken did not, well, shockingly, chicken did not live up to its name. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrified and ran, ran the other direction. So Cook is flush with cash. William is not. But you know what? He joins Cook for his celebration drinks at the Raven Pub. He decides, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna revel in my friend's success. It's wonderful. Let's have some champagne. Let's have some drinks. Let's have some brandies. <laughs> that he's paying for. You know, <laughs> that's that's what the Cook is paying for, yeah. Cook drinks uh, some gin there and he starts to complain that his throat is burning. He says, there's something wrong with my drink. And Palmer makes a very big scene, stands up and goes, no, don't be silly. There's nothing wrong with it. Look, I'll take this tiny... Tiny, tiny sip of it. There's nothing wrong at all. The rest of the customers in the pub are being used, going, we, we didn't ask. Why, yeah. why are you shouting and standing on the table? By all accounts, as well, a servant has earlier seen Palmer standing in the corridor. This is where the twirly, twirly moustache and hat yeah. bit comes in. He actually sees Palmer standing by a gas lamp, holding <laughs> up the drink, Perfect. inspecting it. He sees the servant, backs into his room, shuts the door for a bit, and then comes out and goes, here you go, cook. Here's your drink. <laughs> <laughs> These people were not subtle. Well, Palmer probably thought he was being subtle. He didn't know that the servant was going to come in. And Palmer, again, he's very confident. Yeah. He's very confident What's in his abilities. It's a slight, it's a slight, it's a slight, Raven. Excellent name for a pub. Excellent name for a pub. But Cook does grow ill. He even goes so far as to say, I believe that damn Palmer is dosing me. <laughs> no one really pays any attention to this. Oh. Not even Cook. Cook still, even though he says it, he says it slightly in jest, he still remains friends with Palmer. Sorry, can I just ask? So is he taking out a life insurance thing on Cook? No, no, Cook is no, just no, his friend. Just a friend. No, no, that, that avenue was very much cut off right, by okay. every insurance company <laughs> in Staffordshire and possibly beyond. Like, no more insurance for <laughs> no you, insurance sir. For you. So, I've got a horse. You've got a horse. <laughs> Take the life insurance out on the horse. Its name is Chicken. Insured for fourteen million pounds. Sign here. Yes, absolutely, sir. People, no horses. Yes, absolutely. More insurance policies on horses. Actually, horses probably would have been insured quite highly sure yes, they were, if, they, if they were winners. I think. <laughs> if only Palmer had a decent if, horse. If they weren't, I think they were glue. <laughs> so, they're back in Rugley. 
Cook has a room in the Talbot Arms because he's still not feeling very well. Palmer's house is opposite Palmer because he's his friend. He is a qualified physician. Palmer sort of ends up taking more care of Cook. He's really, really attentive to him. You know, he does all the usual things that a friend would do. He brings him medicine. He prepares him broth. He brings him extra gin. He goes to the bookies to collect his winnings for him. All the usual things that you do for a friend who's not well. So Cook is in the Talbot Arms and over the course of about a week or so, he's not doing well. He's vomiting a lot. Also, at the time in the Talbot Arms a maid who was cleaning up after Cook also falls ill Um, and it's said that she tasted some of the broth that Cook had left over a gift from Palmer at different points and as is um, reported in one recording Cook was rolling about in intense pain his whole body jerking convulsively his eyes bulging out of his head and he was beating the bed with outstretched arms he gasped for breath hardly able to speak, and when he did, he cried murder and called on Christ to save his soul. Later, his limbs became rigid, as if paralysed. But Cook dips in and out of this illness. He again meets Palmer for a drink. I like Cook's resolve, actually. This is what I would do. I thought, go to the pub. I can still go to the pub. I'm feeling a bit better. Gin! Gin immediately. Gin will help everything. (laughs) What we do know is that William had purchased three grains of a certain poison from a local surgery which he reportedly puts into two pills for Cook, gives them to him, and Cook dies in agony on the 21st of November, 1855, aged 28. 28? Christ, I imagined him being older than that, I don't know why. His body was bent back like a bow, resting on the back of his head and his heels. What do you think the poison is? Well, I think I know what this one is. It's strychnine. It's strychnine, isn't it? Stry- oh, I say strychnine. I say strychnine. strychnine. Well, there we go. You say strychnine, and I say strychnine, <laughs> strychnine, strychnine, strychnine. We've got, we've got a new jingle. We do have a new jingle, yay. If anyone would like to write that jingle for us, send it in, please do. Strychnine, strychnine, you decide. So, a particularly uh, horrible poison. Horrible nastiness. Yes, I believe poison. you've got some background on strychnine, I do, haven't you? I do, I have vicious, vicious stuff. Um, comes from a tree, comes from uh, the seeds of a tree um, mm. found in Asia and in India. And it's used as a pesticide. Used as a pesticide, kill rodents and your, your mice. So again, one of those things that in Victorian times, much like we discovered with arsenic last week, was relatively readily available. Again, one of those things that in small doses is good for you. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> yes, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contest the small yes. doses of strychnine. I mean, it would have to be incredibly small. It was also used in home remedies in the Victorian era because of the attacks that it does because it attacks the central nervous system at at its worst it sort of was seen in very 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 tiny doses as a little restorative giving you a little bit of a perk perking up the (laughs) muscles uh, in the same way that I think in arsenic and phosphorus and things that people would have as a tonic people would use it to give you a little bit of a exuberant bit of a kick kick but at its worst yeah, I mean, it's primarily, I mean, it contracts all your muscles. It makes you convulse. So as one of your descriptions earlier, that people end up with their back bent in two because they can't control the spasms of, of muscles. Most people die through asphyxiation. They can't breathe. Their muscles in their chest have contracted and tightened so much that you can't you can't breathe. It is um, gruesome. It is nine. T- terrible. And in, it builds up in your system and gets worse and worse and worse. In small doses, um, yes. If you so have if a big dose, then, oh, then, then you're out. Yeah, if you're, if you're taking handfuls of the stuff, then, <laughs> then you're out. But it is one that can be a couple of grains in your in your broth or in mm. your gin or something. It's going to build up over time. Goodness. Um, I think I read somewhere that in, um, I think probably in A is for Arsenic by Catherine Harkup, yeah. um, wonderful, wonderful writer. Because it attacks the central nervous system, it also attacks, what well, attacks or affects the nerve endings of the brain so you are really hyper aware of what's happening even though you're suffering yeah you're completely conscious and you know what's happening you know to a much more heightened extent than you are normally you know exactly what's happening to your body and have no control over it but there we go we have john cook he is dead and all we have is this link that some at some point william palmer bought strychnine now in the aftermath what do you what do you think uh William Palmer would have done as a sensible man. I, I imagine he probably went straight away raiding his wardrobes and his <laughs> and his wallet for his his money and went straight down the the horse racing or something like that. He absolutely did. He didn't go to the <laughs> racing, but he whips around the room. He searches everything. He takes his wallet. He goes through his paperwork. He starts forging documents to show that Cook owed him or other people thousands of pounds. But Cook's stepfather turns up, William Stevens. 
and he is a no-nonsense man. He didn't entirely approve of John Cook's way of life. He didn't like the fact that he gambled and he drank, and he certainly has no cares for William Palmer at all. He looks around for his son's betting books. Now, this is quite common at the time. You would have a betting book, mm. and it would keep a track of all of your debts and all of your payments, but it is missing. It is nowhere to be found. William Palmer is claiming that Cook owed £4,000 in bills, and he's willing to take on the money and obviously go and pay for them. He's a generous man again. Um, but Stephen says no, and he demands Good. an inquest. Palmer at the time is now a little bit edgy. He's asking around, oddly, to some medical people going, what, what would happen if a dog took strychnine? W- would you be able to find traces of it in the stomach? I'm, yeah, because I'm just thinking, from the descriptions we've just read, you, you know if you're, you're convulsing and your muscles are tense and one of those says your back is bent in half. It's not a calm and relaxed way to go. I mean, no. unlike arsenic, which is mistaken for many other things, is it mm. cholera? This is a violent violent death and another poison that we're seeing at the time as we've said in previous episodes as well where people think it is undetectable Mm. and it's not been used in any famous cases before people don't seem to know about strychnine they know of its uses but in terms of poisoning Palmer believes that this is undetected when he's told by a friend that if you looked for traces of um, strychnine in a dog who had been poisoned they wouldn't find any he snaps his fingers and says it's all right then to himself and wanders off so the post-mortem takes place at the Tolbert Arms in in this a lot of the the autopsies and inquests take place in pubs yes I did not know this yes no I did know that why people eat there well no I didn't they did didn't they? I think. Well, they drink there. The place of drink. But also, there were, I suppose there were big spaces, and they were used to holding a lot of people in a in one big communal room. Well, that shows my naivety um, in it because I'm just thinking the, of like, oh, an autopsy. Let's the pub. Just, just, just clear off the bar. It's fine. Just put the body on there. Maybe we should bring it back. Because I suppose it's a time where you didn't have medical clinics and hospitals and things in small villages and towns, and these places were difficult to travel to without the modern transportation. So you needed somewhere you could do it. So the post- post-mortem is set up. Various people are involved in this post-mortem process. William Palmer also has a little bit of a say in it. He starts to sort of talk to people around and saying, oh, well, if, it, if there's going to be a post-mortem, maybe we should use it as a training exercise. Maybe we should... Uh, it's a pretty a cut, a cut and dry case, isn't it? So, um, yeah, bring, bring some medical students in and we can all observe what's happening. Uh, the person who actually performs the autopsy is a medical student. He's inexperienced. He's quite nervous. William Palmer very kindly gives him some brandy to steady his nerves. So he's <laughs> a little bit drunk by the this time it's happening. Um, so he and assistant are carrying it out William and others are observing the whole time and the reports say that as the student is taking out the contents of John Cook's stomach which is the crucial area that needs to be examined mm. William bangs into him <laughs> nudges him as he's doing not subtle yeah. but it's just banging into him while he's doing the autopsy to the point where he's told can, can you not do that <laughs> yes. literally they say please don't do that it's actually on record the stomach samples are taken out. They're not taken out in the in the best way. I think it's recorded that, that it was a bit clumsy the way it was done. But William says, let me take them. They turn around and see him sort of sneaking off holding the jar. The way they've sealed it, it seems like the seals have been cut. So William has tampered with the samples. He's doing everything he can to make sure that this mm. is not going to go well. It's sent off to a medical expert, Dr. Taylor, who was quite well known at the time and he was a toxicologist. Um, he looks at the samples and goes, these are rubbish. Why have you sent them to me and demands more and demands a second post-mortem now things are beginning to spiral for William he starts bribing the postmaster to intercept letters to the coroner the postmaster is actually found out later on and convicted of tampering with the mail he writes to the coroner Mr Ward asking just suggesting that perhaps uh, natural causes might be recorded and he encloses the reports of what it is varies either a, a crisp £10 note But others have said that he sends a hamper that is filled with turkey, a brace of pheasants, cod, and a barrel of oysters. Right. That's a nice hamper, isn't it? It's a good hamper. I'm assuming this hamper, all these lovely things, have got big needle marks in them. Whereas (laughs) they're now just like... (laughs) Well, I was just worried that they were all alive. The guy opens it and a turkey and a brace of pheasants just just jump out and he's like, Oh God, you did not think this through. But the coroner is an honest man and he does not like this one bit. And he says, despite there being very little physical evidence of poison in John Cook's body, he states his belief that John Cook is poisoned. Good. So we have a case now against William Palmer. The Home Secretary on the run up to the trial calls for Annie Palmer and Walter Palmer's bodies to be exhumed. Again in a pub. 
Walter's body is so decomposed they cannot examine it. They can't yeah. take anything from it. But luckily the smell lingers in the pub for months afterwards. Oh, good, good. So there was some effect from nice. that. Well, you're going to need a drink after that, aren't you? So you're probably in the best place. Annie's body was seen to contain traces of antimony. Oh. Antimony, which is... Heavy metal poisoning. It is a heavy metal, po- heavy metal poisoning, which is a different, a very different kind of poison from strychnine, something that can be administered over time again produces the effects of vomiting of cholera very slow poisoning now the defense is going to be built on the fact that there is no evidence of strychnine in the body of john cook there's been none found william is a a respectable man and john cook clearly died of tetanus where the prosecution is going to use its expertise to prove that there is a clear motive for the killing prove that a poisoning took place pills that he's given cook the tampering with the evidence the bribing of the coroner it's all mounting up and then there's also the series of suspicious deaths in Palmer's life aside from John Cook. I'm glad that someone's putting it together at long last. And I'm going to read you the list of the victims. And some of these are quite upsetting. Okay. George Abley, in 1846, who challenged William Palmer to a drinking contest at the Lamb and Flag pub. An hour after this contest ended, with Abley being the victor, Abley was carried out of the pub and died in his bed. Cause of death, misadventure. Annie's mother... Annie's mother died in 1849, just after visiting Palmer and having lent him money. Cause of death, apoplexy, known as internal bleeding of the organs, but it really was the cause given for any sudden death. Leonard Bladden, a man that Palmer had met at the races in 1850 and who had lent him £600. Bladden died at Palmer's house in agony. Cause of death, abscess in the pelvis due to an old hip injury. (laughs) Elizabeth Palmer. William Palmer's daughter died January 1851 aged two and a half cause of death convulsions Henry Palmer William Palmer's son died January 1852 aged one month cause of death convulsions Frank Palmer William Palmer's son died December 1852 aged seven hours old cause of death convulsions John Palmer, William Palmer's son, died January 1854, aged three days old. Cause of death, convulsions. Annie Palmer, William Palmer's wife, died 1854, aged 27. Cause of death, cholera. Infant, name unknown, William Palmer's illegitimate son, died 1855, aged five months after visiting his father. Cause of death, unknown. Walter Palmer, brother, died 1855, cause of death, not recorded. That was pretty harsh. William Palmer's eldest son, also named William, was the only child who lived beyond infancy and ended up outliving his father. His other four children all died in infancy from convulsions. I mean, I think, I mean, infant mortality was obviously, is obviously a terrible thing, and but I think it was a, probably a lot more, the rates were a lot higher Infant then, death was not, was, uncommon, was not uncommon at the time. And I was going to think, I mean, everyone else, if he if he has done, let's say, if, if he has done away with uh, Cook and his his wife and the, the brother and things like that, that was for a, a gain. He got something out of it. Mm. What would he get out of killing his, his children? Well, infant death was not uncommon, but it's far more likely that William just did not want to spend the money feeding them. Mm. A former cleaning lady who quit after the fourth child's death was heard in a local pub swearing that she thought that William had done away with the babies just to avoid more mouths to feed. That's just, yeah. If we rack up all of the deaths, this is a man who does not have much care for human life. So William is tried for murder of John Cook and also forgery for forging his mother's signature. And at this point, there is a media frenzy. This case is huge we know how big it is we've talked about in the beginning that this became legend throughout uh, literature and fiction and non-fiction but it's a doctor it's a respectable man it's a poisoning we're coming out of poison panic people are interested in this and also the papers are really starting to go for this they are dredging up every story that they can find about william palmer this is proper tabloid press they want to know about his family they know about all of these other suspected deaths in his life soon they're attributing any death that had happened in the last five years to william yeah. palmer poisonings in the past these are oh, they're often by women and they're crimes of passion but these are now respectable people and their motivation is money 
Now, something happens as a result of this case that actually changes legal proceedings for the future and still affects us today. Because of William's notoriety in Staffordshire and because the press are just absolutely having a field day with him, it's argued that William cannot stand trial in Staffordshire. Oh, because he wouldn't get a fair trial. He wouldn't get a fair trial. Oh, that's interesting. It is argued that he must stand trial in the Old Bailey because he cannot get a fair trial at home. This is then set as an act of Parliament. It becomes law. It's known as the Palmer's Act. It um, comes into place in 1856. And it says that it allows crimes committed outside of London or Middlesex to be tried at the Old Bailey to make sure that there's no risk of prejudice with the jury. This still happens today. The ex-journalist in me finds this fascinating. <laughs> gotcha. There's arguments about would he get a fair trial in Stafford most people are saying because everyone hates him most of the people would have known one of his victims they've also read about him in the paper and they think he is a monster there's also been an argument that he would have been found not guilty in Staffordshire that actually people liked William Palmer he was uh, reportedly a very good Christian he went to church there's some sort of political motivation as well that has been argued a little bit of conspiracy theory coming in here but they wanted to move it to the Old Bailey to make sure that he was found guilty but either way this trial affects legal proceedings for the future so I find that fascinating I think that's amazing I like that fact so there we are William Palmer stands trial in the Old Bailey and the prosecution is incredibly strong. It's led by Attorney General Alexander Coburn, who later becomes the first Lord Chief Justice of England. Two chemists testify to having sold Palmer strychnine. Even though they had not recorded it on the register, they did come back and they gave evidence. It was only for arsenic at the time. It was, yes. It was only for arsenic. You didn't need to worry about. No, so, but (laughs) they still came back and they talked about it. That shows why it's flawed, but they were able to give evidence. Maybe Palmer thought he was safe in that sense. Maybe he was buying strychnine thinking, well, we don't have to write it down. Yeah, I don't have to sign for this one. (laughs) But everything comes back to haunt him. And the the defence, while they try and they try and reason that there is no evidence of strychnine, no one has found strychnine in John Cook's system. It's never conclusively proven that strychnine was the cause of death but they find in favour of poisoning the trial lasts 12 days the jury takes just over an hour to return a guilty verdict and William would meet his fate on that scaffold in Stafford on the 14th of June 1856 where he was hanged by the neck until he was dead still never admitting what he had done in front of 30,000 people 30,000 people after his death the rope that was used to hang Palmer was sold in pieces as souvenirs for five shillings an inch. That's mad. And after his death, his mother is said to have cried, they have hanged my saintly Billy. Yeah, that... So not there we are. Short, not entirely sure to say to that one. So there we that are. That is... There's the case of William Palmer. It's a really um, well-documented case. I found some fantastic writings on them. Some of the sources that I've used today, um, several books. I always read across several books and several online articles. A couple worth mentioning. A really good article by Kieran Conleaf. is a really good writer. He writes on head stuff. Um, he called it the Prince of Poisoners. I think his Twitter handle is Shiny Empty Head. I'll put this in nice. the episode description. Also, The Secret Poisoner by Linda Stratton. Uh, Poisoner in the Dock, all sorts of books that cover this. But hes it's a really, really famous case. People always arguing about, you know, should he have been convicted because there was no evidence of strychnine? But when we look back at all of the deaths that he was involved in, we are pretty much looking at a psychopath who has absolutely no regard for human life other than his own gain. Yeah. I, I still can't square the killing of the children. That is a terrible terrible thing very Um, upsetting i know when i was reading that and putting it all together just the way it's listed and that's why i wanted to read it out in that way it's just a roll call of death and annie his wife has lost four children and is absolutely bereaved and he can then just take out life insurance and go well she's sad she's got a broken heart and blah 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 sudden death because she's lost all of her babies there was a theory as well that um because of william and annie's blood types uh were quite different that it could have caused just a malfunction of the children or in their DNA basically yeah. but I think uh, yeah. modern science would disprove that somewhat pretty much <laughs> so yeah. yeah no I think we can probably discount that um, as a possibility it's, um, a, it's a case that has divided people I, d- I don't think it should divide people I think it's pretty damn cut and dry that this is an absolute psychopath oh there's no question of that but people did try to argue it because of this lack of evidence and we've seen it as well in, in George Lampson's case before where you didn't have evidence you couldn't actually find the poison in the in the victim's body it was just enough to prove that a poisoning had taken place it does make you think if something like that would stand, probably wouldn't stand up in today's but mm. today you wouldn't be able to get away with saying 
this person has been poisoned. Mm. I can't tell you what poison has been has been used. No. But I know this person bought some poison, therefore th- there must be a link. This was the first case of someone convicted of yeah. murder by strychnine. They don't know what they're looking for. They didn't so. know what they're looking for. So you're seeing people in convulsions and it wasn't detectable or they couldn't find it. Maybe they could have found traces in it, but they didn't find any trace in John Cook's body. But then this was also a case of absolute media frenzy. Any newspaper just knew William Palmer's story, knew William Palmer's story. Let's talk to these people. He's a monster. He's evil. What's the psychology of these new poisoners who are prevalent amongst us? It's interesting because you may think like in modern days how everyone complains and rips the tabloids to shreds about what a dreadful thing they are. Yeah, and rightly so and, these and, days. And completely rightly so. But I mean, what, I'm, what I mean is that this is not a new thing. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's been going on for obviously hundreds of years. Nothing and, new at all. People were people interested. people have that interest and people want to know the ins and outs and the grisly details of everyone really? of people's lives this is the time uh, of the ten- penny dreadfuls as well yeah. you want to hear it's about these worse things than it is now <laughs> absolutely there, there must be a genuine fear because this is the unknown for some people the poisonings that are happening the accidental deaths suddenly this is a crime people are being convicted they are going oh my god well, people not... can just poison us willy nilly well, yeah that's if you're not careful you're, you're seeing murderers over your shoulder there was also uh, I think Dr Taylor who was involved in this the toxicologist um he was quite inexperienced with talking to the press and he advisedly gave interviews not about the case um but he just sort of drew conclusions about poisonings and about what was happening and then in in retrospect he was he was terribly upset about what he'd said and how the press had taken it and twisted it when he talked about strychnine poisoning the fact that um in some cases it was undetectable he had to sort of beg beg the press please don't put that in because you're giving people ideas (laughs) ideas, you're giving people ideas everyone's reading going oh yes strychnine well well, we can't use arsenic anymore. Bloody hell, that's screwed. Ooh, strychnine. There's a new poison mm-hmm. on the block. Oh, a new okay. poison, everybody. New poison alarm bell. Yay. Let's go out <laughs> to the poison shop and purchase things to do away with our loved ones. Are we going to have now a strychnine klaxon? A strychnine klaxon. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I do like strychnine. It seems like he did use a mix of poisons. Yes, you are Anthony. me. From the uh, mm. the other, I can't remember the woman. Uh, his, his wife. His wife. His wife. Yeah, traces um, of that in there. Um, and again, I mean, John Cook could have had all manner of poisons administered. We have the record of the of the grains of strychnine being bought. Did Palmer know how much it took to kill someone? Again, everyone's experimenting. The everyone's experiment. Yeah. trying different things. But if only he had taken out life insurance on his horse, then all would have been well. All would have been all well. This could have been saved. Chicken. If, if there was a fucking better name for a horse. <laughs> If he hadn't bet on bloody chicken, <laughs> if he had just if he had chosen gone for anyone star, else, his mate, an experienced gambler who's had a lot of success at gambling, knows his horses, has gone for pole star. I'm not going to follow him. My mate who knows what he's doing, he he's, <laughs> earns a living out of this gambling malarkey. I'm going to go with chicken. All could have been saved if he had. A, if it wasn't mm, for that horse named chicken. If it wasn't for that horse named chicken. Chicken! And also, Mummy has something to answer for, I think, in oh, this case. certainly. Mummy spoilt yes. son. Yeah. Naughty Mummy. Well, it'd be after interesting him. to hear how she reacted to knowing that her son was suspected of killing her other son, his brother. She didn't believe it. She just said, he, no. but they have, as, as, as we heard at the end, <laughs> they have killed my saintly Billy. So that absolute denial of a parent, I suppose. Again, it comes down to Money. Money. The greatest the poison, greatest poison of, of them all. Oh, that's another catchphrase. Well, we've talked about William Palmer, Prince of Poisoners, who is pretty much up there, as in uh, yeah. on the on the bastard level. Uh, high bastard level. High bastard level. Should we have level. a bastardometer? <laughs> bastardometer. <laughs> we'll draw one. We'll draw <laughs> no, it on the wall. No one can see. <laughs> We're just going to have a line across Nick's wall, Nick's very beautiful white walls that he's done in his lovely house. I'm going to get a sharpie and then put William. Bastard. We'll just have a level of and bastard. then L- 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 George Lampson, I think, was further down. You know, yes, drug yeah, addict. You know, certainly. not so much. Yeah. Um, Humbug Billy. Oh, he's, uh, no, he, no, no, no. He, doesn't, he doesn't even appear on the bastard no. level. You know, but we'll yeah. see. We'll see how the bastard level. And what's um, interesting to see how high we can go. But just that it goes off the wall and <laughs> oh. into the other, into another room entirely. Yes. <laughs> into next door. <laughs> We're out on the street on the gr- and just drawing on the ground going, the bastard level needs to extend. Don't you understand what we're doing here? But it's we have, plan. we do, we have a plan. That was uh, William Palmer. We had a delicious white lady. Yeah, they, they've gone down the street. I they are want gone. another one of those. Yeah. Uh, now we're wrapping up. I think we should drink several more of these for research. <laughs> and there's, there is a residue at the end of this. Well, that's just the egg whitiness. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much you want the drink. Just... For anyone wondering what that sound was, that was me smashing the glass against my teeth. Not actually breaking it, but it, it hurt. Yeah, because, I'm more concerned um, about the glasses than your teeth, to be honest. You really are. Yeah. 
You really are. <laughs> this is how our friendship works. Is as he just he gives me the glasses and just, just they, don't, don't break, break it. <laughs> After I told you a lovely story. Yeah, a delightful death, story. A delightful and story. Death and horror. Hope you've enjoyed our lovely jolly tale. If not, go and make yourself a white lady because you will enjoy that. Steady your nerves with a white lady. Yeah. We feel. As ever, send us your suggestions of other poisoners you'd like to hear about or poisoning cases. Uh, what do you think about William Palmer? Are there other facts that you know? Or do you think he was innocent? Or do you think he registers high on the bastard level? <laughs> also, send us your suggestions of cocktails if you wish to. Or send us pictures of you enjoying cocktails over the weekend. We love to see those. Please do follow us if you like what you hear on Facebook at The Poisoner's Cabinet. On Instagram at The Poisoner's Cabinet. On Twitter, we're at The Poisoner's Cab. Do we do anything on Twitter? We do. do I, I don't have a Twitter account. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't tweet. I don't know. I post stuff on Twitter. Well, good for you. I'm, it's... Well, there's anyone listening, actually. It's a really good point. I work in social media by day, and I'd just like to, I'd like to use it as research, actually. Does do any, any of use you Twitter? use Twitter anymore, rather than just to go on there and rant? Um, which is great for, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes, do you use Twitter? Are we wasting our time? Are we just wasting well, everyone's not. time? Well, you're not. You're not doing anything. I'm there. <laughs> sweat, blood and tears. You know how long this story took me? I had to troll through Twitter. <laughs> trying to find facts. But yes, follow us on social media. And please do leave us a review if you can on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. iTunes really, really helps us um, to get up the ratings. And tell your friends. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Or listen to it and then use it, our podcast, to not kill your enemies. Yes. We wouldn't possibly suggest that. Please don't kill <laughs> Don't anyone. do that. Please don't. don't. Do that. Oh, God, because then we'd have to stop. Or and then... at least unsubscribe before you do. <laughs> Just clear your internet uh, poss- history. Possibly can't say that either. But. But we really can't say that. We'll wipe your internet history anyway if you're going to kill someone. Because you don't want the last thing that people to look through <laughs> is to see you were looking up, you know, porn and, and, and parachute pants. I don't know. It's a curious combination. I, that's why you should wipe it okay. from your history. I'm, I'm not, not saying that's something I'd I, look I'm, at. I'm not boring it's the worst again. things that I could think of. <laughs> Thanks again, and we will be back next week with a new story. And a new cocktail. We have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.